Hi, Barbara. Hi, how you doing? I can't complain. Uh, let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. You're Barbara Slavin. You are at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., where you direct the Future of Iran initiative. Uh, and we're going to talk about Iran. A lot of uh, Iran-related things happening these days. There is an attempt uh, to restore, through negotiation, the uh, nuclear deal with Iran that uh, was negotiated originally during the Obama administration. Trump abandoned it. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, that. Uh, and and there have been some interesting doings related to that, such as uh, an Israeli attack on uh, Iranian uh, nuclear facilities about a week ago. And, and, and signs uh, recently, I guess... Uh, of at least a conceivable rapprochement or hints of rapprochement between Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we'll, we'll see how much uh, we have time to get to. Uh, but let me let me just start by asking you uh, how you're you're feeling about the prospects of restoring a nuclear deal. I mean, if you want to put uh, precise odds on it, I would be willing to to go ahead and uh, put some money on it somewhere based on your wisdom. But but if you don't want to get quantitative, uh, and could at least give us some sense of how much uh, hope uh, yeah. is warranted among those who would like to see the deal restored. Okay. Um, well, I'm not a betting person normally, but I'll, um, I'll handle that. And you just yeah, give me the odds. Yeah, sixty-five, thirty-five. I think I think it's going to come back. Hmm. Um, and, and I think there, there are a variety of good reasons for it, um, partly the fact that we still have on the Iranian side a negotiating team that negotiated it, although we don't have them for much longer. And we have on the U.S. side uh, many of the people who originally negotiated it. But the main reason is because the Trump policy was such a colossal failure that uh, even even those who opposed the JCPOA back in 2015, and many of them now think it wasn't such a bad deal after all. Um, public opinion polls have shifted. Uh, it's not a burning issue in the United States uh, in the way that some of its opponents would like to pretend. Um, I think Mike Pompeo gave a speech about Iran the other day, and maybe 60 people tuned in. So, <laughs> you know, what can we say? It's just, it's just not a big deal anymore uh, for a lot of people. And um, also, it's a baseline. Look, if we want to talk about other things with Iran, and we certainly do, it's, it's quite clear that the, the price of admission is returning to the original deal. Just restore the status quo ante. Well, we won't entirely restore the status quo ante because Iran has suffered uh, enormously over the last four years. Under, under the sanctions lost. that were reimposed when Trump uh, got out of the deal. Right. And it, yeah, it has lost. It has lost billions in oil revenues. Uh, it has also been hit very hard by COVID. And that COVID experience has been made even more, even worse because of the sanctions, which have prevented it from getting uh, some of the medicine and medical devices it would have been able to to import more easily. And of course, it doesn't have the revenue uh, that it would have had. There have also been developments in the region. You know, one could argue that the suffering of the people of Yemen has been prolonged uh, by um, by the Trump policy, which of course favored Saudi Arabia. Uh, the rift between Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, got worse. Uh, perhaps now it will, we'll see some improvement there, although I'm not holding my breath, frankly. Uh, Iraq suffered. Uh, Qasem Soleimani was killed. Uh, drones hit various targets, including a Saudi oil installation. I mean, there's been a lot of damage over the last four years and while some of it might have occurred even with with the J JCPOA, I think a lot of it would not have. Um, can I also add all of the dual nationals who are still in jail in Iran? Maybe some of them would have been let go years ago. Who knows? But um, clearly the Trump policy did not work and it backfired big time. OK, and, and we should say for people who don't follow us closely, JCPOA is a that that means the deal. That, those are the, the joint uh, comprehensive plan of right. action. Yes. Right. So I guess I'll uh, play devil's advocate and ask you for starters, if if it is so doable and if so many forces favor restoring the deal and so few formidable forces oppose it, 
Why is it seeming so hard to do? I mean, you earlier alluded to the fact that the Iranian negotiating team won't be around for super long. I, I, I assume you mean because there's going to be an Iranian presidential election in a couple of months. And uh, the Biden team has known uh, that that was, well, I don't want to call it a deadline. I, 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 you know, who knows? But if you want to be on the safe side, you get the deal done before that. And yet, uh, they have seemed in no hurry, right? I mean, initially, the, the Biden team came out of the box saying, no, Iran has to make the first move and return to compliance. And then we, we re- relieve the sanctions, which from Iran's point of view, obviously seems backward since we're the ones who abandoned the deal. Now, subsequently, they did slowly ratchet uh, down their compliance. Uh, but it's clear that we're the ones who who yeah. started the whole problem. And so they naturally are like, uh, no, I don't think we should have to go first. Why? Well, for example, that one question is, why did the Biden team put so much emphasis on that? Um, mm-hmm. and, and kind of maybe relatedly, if if forces are aligned in favor of the deal, why has the Biden team seemed to get domestic political blowback, not just from Republicans, uh, but also from, I think, Chuck Schumer, uh, from Menendez, who I guess is head of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. It, it seems like some powerful Democratic actors wanted to get in his way. So uh, why is all of that not cause for deep skepticism? Yeah, well, I'll be honest with you. I had hoped to see more gestures from the Biden administration, particularly on the humanitarian front, Uh, freeing up some of Iran's uh, oil revenues, which are frozen in foreign banks, to be able to use that, say, to purchase vaccines, to to get other supplies needed um, for for COVID in particular. So I was a little disappointed, but um, I had an interesting experience uh, not long ago. I was in a Washington, D.C. bakery, and there was a senior administration official who I know quite well who was also in that bakery, and I said, hey, you know, how come it's taken you guys so long? And he he looked at me over his mask and said, Menendez. So I think that wow. the, the main reason was not so much Menendez has opposed the JCPOA. And he's he takes money from APAC. He takes money from the Mujahideen Hulk, which is a particularly odious Iranian militant group. On Formerly the, on our list of terrorist organizations. Formerly but- and on the outs with the with the Iranian government for, you know, 40 years. Um, and it's not so much because of Menendez's opposition to the JCPOA, but that um, the administration had to get its key nominees through his committee. Hmm. And he's in charge of scheduling hearings and scheduling confirmation votes in the committee. So I think part of it was they needed to get not just uh, Tony Blinken through, but Wendy Sherman, others through that committee and onto the floor uh, and didn't want any any uh, problems with with Menendez. Part of it, I think, also is that it just it took a while to get the the team together on the U.S. side. Um, and also, I think they they were look negotiating from afar to see what they could get out of the Iranians in advance. Turns out, not much. <laughs> uh, the Iranians, in turn, played hard to get. Um, they kept insisting the U.S. go first. And then they they said, all right, fine, we'll go to a meeting. We'll go to some meetings in Vienna, but we won't sit in the same room with the Americans. Um, so we've, been, we've had what I call shadow boxing for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they did get down to business two weeks ago, um, but it's still a little bit awkward that they are passing proposals through the Europeans, you know, and, and, and the Russians and the Chinese, it would go a lot faster if they were sitting in the same room. But there are other things that have happened, which you alluded to. I mean, the Israelis bombing, you know, setting off a bomb in Natanz, the main enrichment facility. Uh, that certainly didn't, uh, didn't help the atmosphere. Um, <laughs> to, to do, you, do you, um, what I've heard about that is that, uh, I think this is David Sanger's reporting that Israel gave the U.S. a heads up at the last minute and wasn't specific. So didn't even give the U.S. time to try to veto it. Uh, but in any event, uh, I mean, what is yeah, your what do you think happened? With- anything the Israelis did to Iran. I mean, the Israelis, you know, when it comes to making sure they have a nuclear monopoly in the Middle East, they have never asked permission from the United States. No, but the U.S. has real leverage. If if a president felt politically free to use it, which is, of course, a big if, 
the U.S. has real leverage over Israel. Yeah. If they well, wanted to stop a specific uh, attack or something of that kind, I suspect yeah. they could do it. But but I think I think Bibi uh, well understands the domestic political situation here and how constrained Biden may feel. Well, Biden is less constrained than most American presidents. I mean, it took him a month to even call Bibi. <laughs> um, I think that maybe Biden this, has, maybe has this a, was payback. Maybe you should have said hello a little earlier. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think Biden has a has a lot of leeway, actually, with 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 BB. I just think BB is not a priority, which may make BB a little nuts. But after all, we're not even sure that BB is going to remain, although he does have incredible staying power. Um, but, you know, he's on trial. <laughs> Yeah. For corruption. And he still hasn't formed a government that has a majority, you know, support in the Knesset. So, no, I don't think that was it so much. Look, um, BB, you know, it wasn't BB, it was Begin. 1981, the Israelis bombed the Osirak reactor in Iraq. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2007, they bombed a reactor in Syria that was under construction by the North Koreans. Um, they have killed a half a dozen Iranian scientists. Uh, most recently, just late last year, um, they they pretty much do what they please. There was uh, Stuxnet, which was a cyber attack on Natanz that was, uh, you know, put together jointly with the United States, with the CIA. Um, but they've also done a lot of stuff on their own. And um, this is simply Israeli policy. As I say, they want to make sure that they are the only ones in the Middle East that have nuclear weapons or even close to that. Let me, I, I want to ask about that because is, uh, you mentioned that uh, one thing about Bibi's current situation is that once he's no longer, as I understand it, I mean, I think they're proceeding with the criminal proceedings in any of it, but I gather that if once he's no longer prime minister, he's much more likely to actually go to jail. Uh, so, uh, he has a strong incentive to remain prime minister. And one thing I've always wondered, and this is a generic question in situations like this with with any nation uh, in, in a way when it's kind of playing tough with some adversary and claims a strong national security interest. There's always the possibility that it's more of a personal political interest or at least to some extent, you know, leaders can maintain the, the the fervent support of their people by convincing them that there is an existential threat out there. And I've always wondered, you know, it, it's in a certain sense always in the interest of, of an Israeli political leader for Iran to seem as demonic as possible. So I honestly have trouble separating, like, what is is Israel's national security calculation and what is Bibi's personal political calculation? Yeah, I, I don't know. Bibi Netanyahu personally, so I'm not going to psychoanalyze him. You know what's funny? Can I just give you an anecdote? I went uh, to Israel in 1988 under the auspices of Marty Peretz. I was in the New Republic. I had a one-hour, one-on-one conversation on a park bench with Bibi Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. He was just a Knesset guy, so I didn't pay much attention. I should have. Anyway, I digress. Uh, The... the, um, so, <laughs> yeah, well, look, he, he has used his, he has used Iran very effectively as a scapegoat and as an excuse for not doing anything on the Palestinian issue, used it for years. Um, on the other hand, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has an extremely hostile policy toward the state of Israel, has supported groups that have carried out terrorist acts in Israel and at their various uh, commemorations, regularly chant death to Israel. So you could say that they are giving a gift to Bibi. Um, but at the same time, you know, Israel is an existential threat to Iran and not the other way around because Israel has, what, 100 or more nuclear weapons? And Iran has no nuclear weapons, Um you know, so it's it's always hard to separate the rhetoric from, rhetoric from from the reality. Um, but Israel is a very strong country and uh, militarily certainly far superior to Iran. Mm-hmm. So um, as for the deal, the, uh, I, when I ask you, uh, you so they could just restore the status quo ante, I, I really meant just in terms of. The deal, like in other mm-hmm. words, we, you know, in terms of sanctions, we go back to where we were when the, after the ne- deal was negotiated. You know, you take all these sanctions off; they go back to exactly the compliance they agreed to uh, back then. Uh, but there has been, um, and that, that that's one reason this it seems so in principle simple to restore the thing. I mean, Trump did complicate things by 
uh, providing different official rationales for some of the sanctions. They're nominally about human rights now or something, but still, in principle, it's like you know which sanctions were which. You could, in principle, do it, but of course, there are uh, you know, domestic political forces, these Iran hawks, people at Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and so on, uh, who, uh, well, they, they oppose the deal to begin with, uh, but uh, in any event, I mean, so they, they just don't want it to happen, but but they also would like, you know, if there is to be a deal, for it to encompass a lot of other things uh, that aren't part of the nuclear program per se, like just conventional ballistic missiles, for example, right? Now, you're smiling. Is that... Yeah, because, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a grand bargain offer from Iran in 2003, and the Bush administration didn't even deign to reply. There is no grand bargain with Iran anymore. And those who are arguing for you know, loading up the the JCPOA with all this other stuff, just don't want any agreement with Iran. The way, I mean, the Iranians have made it very clear that we can return to the original agreement and then there can be discussions about other issues. But those those other issues have to be discussed in other formats and with other parties. The P5 plus one, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany cannot negotiate over Yemen or over Iran's relationship with Saudi Arabia. You know, those are those are different issues and they have to be dealt with in, in different uh, forums. Um, so, no, these people, you know, it's just an excuse, really. Uh, and th- the reason I say you can't quite restore, I mean, when the JCPOA was reached, many of the provisions lasted, you know, at that time, a long time, 25 years. Well, we've lost how many years now? You know, six years. Yeah. So a lot of the provisions now are coming to a close. For example, in 2023, the UN embargo on any uh, assistance to Iran's ballistic missile program expires. Um, in 2023, the U.S. Congress is supposed to legislate sanctions relief, not just through executive orders. Uh, when you say they're supposed to, where does that expectation? Under the JCPOA, under, under the JCPOA. original JCPOA. Um, Iran's parliament is supposed to uh, pass the additional protocol of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which um, which allows for even more intrusive inspections. Yeah. Uh, there are other provisions that allow Iran to legally um, do uh, work on more advanced centrifuges. And then in the year, I guess in January 2031, the limit to 300 kilograms of low enriched uranium, that comes off. So, you know, it's, yeah, we get it back, but we don't get it back for as long as we would have liked. Uh, Iran has suffered irreparable damage and may may not get the benefits, uh, you know, that it, it originally anticipated, even if we do lift those sanctions because of a lot of other things that have happened. So you can't just flick a switch. And I think that's that's part of the problem. Um, and and also, there are just a lot of hard feelings, you know, particularly on the Iranian side that have that make this very tricky. But they would if you said, let's just get back to where we were, they would take that deal. Right. I mean, yeah, I think they will. And that's why I'm sixty five, thirty five. I think uh-huh. they'll take that deal because I think they need the sanctions relief. They need access to almost a hundred billion dollars in hard currency that's frozen abroad. They need to be able to to sell oil openly and not just smuggle it through Malaysia, which is what they've been doing for the last year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that's you know they they want it, but um, it's it's tricky. Look, the 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 their neighbors are very concerned about Iran getting richer because they're afraid that a lot of that money is going to be used to support militias that um, have intervened in various conflicts in the region. Uh, it's, 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 just, it's just not where we were. And we don't know, frankly, where we would have been had this not occurred. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's still, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very bittersweet. So you think, but, but you think Iran would settle for, you know, getting back in terms of the deal, to where we were in the beginning, and I gather you, you you are convinced that that's really what the Biden administration wants, notwithstanding the the, the demands of the uh, Iran hawks. And, and if that's it's a, what if that's it wants a, for now, because what? it wants to get out of the Middle East, it wants to park this. 
yeah. and not have to worry about it. It wants to get out of Afghanistan. It wants to reduce U.S. troop commitments uh, throughout the region and focus on other things, you know, focus on China, focus on climate. Yeah. Uh, it's got other other fish to fry. So if if Iran and the U.S. both want the same deal, I mean, the Biden administration and the Iranian regime both want the same deal. Uh, where does the 35 percent come from? Just Mm. crazy stuff going wrong, BB successfully sabotaging it, just you know, noise. Look, uh, BB's not not stopping, is he? So what is he going to attack next? Who is he going to kill next? Well, at some um, point, you got to lay down the law. I'm sorry, we do have a lot of leverage <laughs> with Israel. And I, it's all, I've always kind of wondered... What exactly are the constraints on a president? I mean, clearly, well, they're, they're... You know, it's it's not just Bibi. Look, uh, the Supreme Leader could die. That yeah. could throw things into into chaos in, in Iran politically. Mm-hmm. Um, they might have a tough time making any decisions until they have a new Supreme Leader or, you know, yeah. um, they're, you know, I suppose Iran could be responsible for some horrible terrorist act uh, that would completely change public opinion. In the United States uh, and in the Western world, uh, I hope not. But it's it you know it's it's a pariah regime for a reason. Something awful could happen that could be tied to the Iranians. Uh, so that's why you know it's the Middle East. <laughs> yeah, um, things you know you always say things can't get worse. Well, in the Middle East they usually do. So I want to leave myself some some wiggle room. Yeah, I mean. Um... When you say it's a pariah regime for a reason, um, what do you what do you actually mean? Because with respect to Israel, it seems to me in recent years, Iran has in a certain sense exhibited restraint, right? Like Israel assassinates an Iranian scientist. Iran doesn't do anything to speak of. Um, there has been this tit for tat. Iran, Israel started attacking Iranian ships. Yeah. And Iran has kind of done this, you know, patty cake retaliation. But it seems to me they're they're. There is a tit for tat going on and, and, and there, and I'm sure that's one source of uncertainty about the deal. That could get out of hand. Uh, but Iran isn't, uh, you know, they're not escalating. And similarly with this attack, I mean, this is an act of war. Israel blew stuff up at an Iranian yeah. nuclear facility. That's an act of war. Iran's not going to do anything in particular. Well, uh, it, may, it may just be a lack of capacity. I mean, there have been reports that Iran is casing Israeli embassies and things like that. Uh, it may just be that that Iran's, uh, you know, uh, 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 much touted Quds force, Jerusalem force, just ain't what it used to be. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's just not very good at it, whereas the Mossad still is damn good at this stuff. Um, you know, we we don't know. I mean, I, I the Iranian intelligence services and, and security people seem to focus much more on throwing uh, innocent journalists and uh, scholars and dual nationals into prison and building phony cases against them than they do uh, going after real threats, like whoever it was that allowed Natanz to be attacked again. I thought they had said they had fingered a suspect or something, but in any event, Who knows? Uh, I, I, mean, I guess the main point happens, is that right? is that... You know, but but take take Israel out of it. The Soleimani assassination. It seemed to me that their response it did involve ballistic missiles, but it seems to me it was very carefully calibrated. They could have killed American troops if they had wanted to. No, actually, the reports I've read suggested that we just got damn lucky. What they did I, was they they warned us. Well, that's why we didn't kill any troops. They evacuated. They warned them. the Iraqis that it was coming. Right. And so our troops took cover. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, the it, it was quite an attack. And um, well, sure, we did something completely outrageous from their point of view. And, and, and you know, it's like uh, almost unprecedented in the, you know, uh, but, but the point is they tipped us off through Iraq and as a result didn't kill anybody, but did a huge show of force. I thought that was pretty impressively calibrated personally. Yeah, and then they shot down a Ukrainian airliner and, well, killed, that was a mistake. In, and killed all those innocent people. That was so, a mistake, but that was a mistake. Yeah, well, anyway, I, you know, I've not been that, that impressed by their, their, their capabilities, and uh, they have been under sanctions. Uh, they are hurting. Uh, there's a COVID epidemic going on. They, they're losing 400 people a day now. It's, it's shooting up again which is a huge number of people dying every day, given the size yeah. of everyone's population. 
So they have some other priorities. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, that- and, and um, also I think that they indeed, uh, you know, took the advice of many of us. I mean, I remember writing a piece some years back entitled hold on Iran regime change is coming to Washington. <laughs> and um, indeed regime change has come and uh, they, you know, Really, until until the Israelis had this latest attack on Natanz, they were even being fairly careful on the nuclear front. It was after that they decided to enrich uranium to 60 percent purity, um, which yes. was a real message to to Netanyahu. I yeah, think. We don't know how soon they can actually do that. Do you have a sense for what the no, level they've of done the- it? They started it. The IEA they, they- is verified. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not that hard. Once you enrich to 20 percent. It's not that hard to go to 60. And from there, it's not that hard to, to go now, to Now, they're doing that at Natanz? Yes. So is, is your sense that the original uh, uh, claims about the amount of damage done to Natanz by the Israeli attack uh, looks a little overstated now in retrospect? I mean... Well, clearly, if they yeah. reached the 60%. I mean, they may have destroyed a bunch of IR-1s, you know, and the Iranians have put some more advanced centrifuges into the mm-hmm. place. Um, you know, I don't know. We'll have to wait for the IEA report yeah. to find out exactly how they're they're making this sixty percent. Yeah, and ninety percent is weapons grade. So this is weapons a clear grade. step in that direction. So let's talk a little more about the uh, the situation inside um, Iran. You, you you talked about how much the sanctions have have hurt both you know common people and just uh, Iranian commercial interests. Uh, government revenue, all kinds of things. And, and it, it almost uh, surprises me that Iran can continue to be, in a, in a sense, as tough at the bargaining table as they are. Like they didn't they didn't succumb to that initial demand. You guys have to go first. They just said, no, screw you. They're yeah. they're very they're, they're, they're very patient. And, and this raises the question of like, how much pressure do you think the regime is under? I mean, there are Iran hawks who, who are like, Believe me, we're close to regime change. Just a little more pressure. You know, just hold on yeah. another year. We got it. What is your sense for how much uh, pressure the regime faces, you know, both from the sanctions and from the internal dissent? Every once in a while you see protests and then, mm-hmm. you know, and, and uh, well, what's your take on how insecure the, the uh, regime may feel or have reason to feel? Well, the Iranians have not given me a visa since 2013. So this is based on secondhand accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would say it's an, the regime has rarely, if ever, been so unpopular. Hmm. Um, I would say that people are thoroughly disgusted with it. On what? What with, are the biggest uh, complaints? Uh, corruption, the poor response to COVID, uh, a policy, a foreign policy that focuses on supporting external actors. Uh, even the nuclear program, frankly, I don't think is as popular as as, as some would would claim. Um, even as a source of, of national prestige, I think uh, I think if there were an election held tomorrow, um, the regime in power would lose. Um, but the question is, what's the alternative? And you, that's you mean if the supreme leader were up for election, which he isn't, or do you mean Rouhani, the president who who, who uh, was elected? Well, you know, look, they don't allow a truly free election. You never, you know, they don't allow uh, individuals to run who oppose the, the current system of government with clerical control. So it's kind of hard to know. But um, there are, I, I mean, in terms of the coming presidential election, there sometimes are very significant choices. I mean, Rouhani, you know, for example. <laughs> well, you, there do are you, choices, but they're not significant choices. Okay, but do you not be, agree that when Rouhani was elected originally, that actually did increase the chances of getting the nuclear deal done, which was uh, actually done under his auspices? I mean, doesn't it matter to some extent who the president is, who the president's foreign minister is, and so on? Yes, well, definitely, because... Uh, you know, he appointed a bunch of experienced people who spoke English. <laughs> that certainly helped. But but the back channel talks that led to the JCPOA began under Ahmadinejad, began mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. Rouhani. And of course, we're blessed by the supreme leader. Um, so even if we don't get back into the deal, you know, before Rouhani leaves office, it, it doesn't mean what, that we won't. I think they're there, you know, because the supreme leader has made the decision that if the U.S. Lists, lifts these sanctions, that Iran will go back into compliance. Um, so, you know, it's it's not a popular government. It's never, you know, the last time there was any kind of sense of 
popular enthusiasm was when Mohammed Hatimi was the president, and particularly in his first term. And that was in the late 1990s when there really was some hope. Um, I haven't detected much hope. And, and, uh, it's, it's, it's very sad to, to see. But the reason the regime will not fall tomorrow, uh, or next year, most likely, is because there is no obvious alternative. And Iranians do not want a Syria or a Yemen or an Iraq. They don't want a failed state. So they'd rather have a, a rotten state <laughs> than no state. Mm -hmm. uh, it's why a lot of authoritarian regimes stay in power for years and years and years. It's this fear of the unknown. The other reason is because the Iranian opposition, particularly in the diaspora, is constantly at each other's throats and does not present a very appealing alternative. They seem to spend most of their time uh, attacking other Iranians who support diplomacy and uh, who want to see the U.S. rejoin the nuclear deal. And, and they engage in very undemocratic and unpleasant behavior, which means that if they, if this lot were in power in Tehran, they'd probably spend most of their time trying to kill off everybody else, the same as the regime did when it came in in 1979. So you have these two factors, no obvious alternative and an extremely dysfunctional opposition, particularly the diaspora, which keeps the Iranian government in power. Um, they also have managed to, to benefit from all the mistakes that other countries have made. So whether it's the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, which helped give us Hezbollah, or the U.S. invasion of Iraq, which opened that country to Iran-backed groups, um, or the uh, Saudi uh, attack on Yemen, which entrenched the Houthis and made them more reliant on Iran. Iran is just a genius at taking advantage of the stupidities of other countries and uh, benefits, you know? Yeah. So I think that's why we won't see regime change. So it sounds like you don't think the presidential election in a couple of months there is as much of a deadline as some people are depicting it as being. Mm, I'm more concerned about the the um, IAEA agreement with Iran that's supposed to expire at the end of May, uh, mm. after which we may be flying blind on the Iranian nuclear program. I'm much because there, the inspectors that. wouldn't be there and the monitoring wouldn't be uh, there? Because they'll turn off the cameras mm. that have been monitoring Iran's production of things like enriched uranium. Um, it, unless that agreement is extended, um, I see that, frankly, as more of a deadline than the Iranian elections, so, which come a few weeks later. But but are but assuming that got taken. Well, let's assume that wasn't there. Are the elect do, do the elections decrease the chances uh, of could the outcome of elections decrease the chances of a deal? They could. Um, the new administration comes in in August. And uh, I think the main concern would be that there's going to be a, a reshuffling of the, the cabinet positions. Mm. Um, but, you know, if a new administration could also keep Abbas Arabchi, the deputy foreign minister, who's now the chief negotiator for Iran, could keep him and his team in place, in mm -hmm. which case it would not be as disruptive. Mm -hmm. So we just don't know. It depends on who wins it, you know, uh, and what the mood is. I think... I'm going to be watching the elections for the, the turnout numbers. If they are very, very low, of course, that, that suggests that the regime's legitimacy is even less than what it's been. And, and what impact that will have on the nuclear talks, I don't know. Will it make Iran more or less flexible? I don't know. But hopefully there will be an agreement. And I think judging from what we've seen in Vienna in the last couple of weeks, there'll be an agreement on the roadmap back into compliance for both sides. And once that agreement is reached, then then it doesn't really matter who's in charge in Tehran as long as they follow the steps uh, and the timelines that are set. Okay. Another question about the, the internal situation in Iran. You know, one thing you often hear is, uh, well, there are these hardliners in Iran and, uh, you know, they have some power and they were skeptical of the deal in the first place. And, uh, so they're, 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 uh, you know, they're not, you know, they're, they're kind of a problem for Rouhani's team. 
And when certain kinds of things happen, like uh, Israel attacking Iran and, and there's no uh, kind of retaliation that allows Iran to save face, that, that further empowers the hardliners and so on. Um, in other words, it's a question of, whether, of, of how much political space there is within Iran. Now, you know, well, people can I just always... say there was retaliation? They're enriching uranium. To well, that's 6%. true. That's true. In that case, that's that, the that was, I got to say, that was pretty smart. I didn't see that coming. Um, that's the retaliation. So, yeah. no, you're, you you're know, right. BB, uh, if BB hits them again, they'll enrich to 90 percent. Uh, actually, I bet they'd be a little <laughs> careful about 90, but I don't know. Maybe. Anyway, the, the, the question is, you know, people often countries, uh, negotiators would always like you to think that they are under fierce domestic political constraints that won't allow them to make concessions. And there's all, there's usually some degree of truth to that. On the other hand, uh, they have an ins- you know, there are domestic political constraints in America that we're well aware of. But, um, what is your take on, on this whole hardliner narrative that like, yeah, I the, think the, it's a bit phony. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think it's a bit phony. Um, there's one decision maker, big decision maker in Iran, and that's the supreme leader. So, you know, hardliner, schmardliner. I mean, um, yeah, I think I think they they use that for effect. There is a parliament, uh, but the parliament is not sovereign, you know, and the decisions of the parliament can be overruled. Uh, so, no, I, 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 I'm less concerned about that. I just would like to see the deal restored with the original negotiators who negotiated. I just think that makes somehow more sense. Also, I think, you know, these people work very hard on this deal. And just mm-hmm. from a personal point of view, I think it's I think it would be nice if they got to actually leave office with the deal back in back in place. They worked very, very hard. Um, it's not just the couple of years the U.S. negotiated with Iran. There were years of negotiations with the Europeans before that. It was actually a 12 year process. Uh, so I think uh, it was Rouhani's signature issue. And uh, it would be it would be, you know, nice for the guy if if he got to leave office with that back. Mm-hmm. Um, how much does popular opinion place any constraint on concessions? I mean, I, I for example, I said, well, they didn't they didn't uh, save face in the wake of this Israeli attack. And you reminded me that actually they did. There, were, uh, there was a non uh, violent retaliation of sorts that presumably made at least some Iranians uh, prouder than they would have been if Iran had just sat there. Is that is that a consideration that the the, the face? I, I think there are people who assume that authoritarian leaders don't have to worry about popular opinion. I've always thought that's wrong. Do you yeah, do you have no, a? There is popular opinion, and they do they do they are aware of it. But in terms of the nuclear deal, you know, if the supreme leader says that's it, you know, halas, no more nuclear program. You know, some people might be outraged, but they're not going to say a word because it's the supreme leader. So this is this is this is top down uh, more than it's bottom up, Uh, although there are some that still see the nuclear program as a sign of Iran's uh, scientific advancement, sign of prestige, that sort of thing. Uh, Okay, and. um, I guess. uh, But on the sanctions front, I mean, I'm kind of wondering, like, how. You say that the Supreme Leader isn't super concerned about his hold on power, but I gather <laughs> No, of, he's in it for life. <laughs> yeah, but there but there has been unrest of a sort that he's not happy about in the past, and there have been crackdowns. And as you said, his legitimacy is probably lower than ever. I mean, I'm wondering if that if that uh for for example gives him a motiva- motivation to be rid of these sanctions so that they can do a better job of uh fighting COVID bringing prosperity to the people and, and uh, so on. I mean, there is yeah. that yeah, amount yes, of sensitivity. Indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, you know, but, but I mean, they need sanctions really for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, actually to, you know, they have this, this uh, agreement with China in order to benefit from that, they need to be able to use their central bank again freely. How um, big do you think that deal is with China? The, the, the basic deal is China will, will kind of, buy their oil or, or somehow notwithstanding sanctions or notwithstanding whatever the U.S. is doing with its uh, central role in the world's financial system, China will find a way to get money to Iran, get oil in exchange, do some investing in Iran, something. It was a big announcement a, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. How big a deal do you think that is? 
It, it's important. I mean, it's similar to deals that China has with all the other countries in, in, in that part of the world. So it's they're not exactly it's not exclusive to Iran. But for Iran to really benefit, um, you know, Chinese companies are not going to want to risk U.S. sanctions to to do big projects in Iran. So it, it would facilitate all of Iran's international trade, commerce and investment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's why they have to get sanctions relief. Um, for the health of the economy uh, as a whole. Uh, millions of Iranians have fallen into poverty under sanctions. Uh, millions of Iranians can't afford to eat meat anymore. I mean, these are, you know, this is a system that um, prides itself on some kind of social justice and uh, and certainly alleviating poverty, putting more people into the middle class was one of its claims to fame and mm-hmm. having a good healthcare system, that kind of thing. So, you know, the, they don't want people to be politically active in opposition, but they, there was a sort of uh, contract that people would at least be able to live some sort of decent life and and have the basics. And that's been threatened by sanctions, as mm-hmm. well as by government mismanagement and corruption. Now, and you sounded dismissive of these hints that Saudi Arabia and Iran are maybe going to start talking about lessening tensions. Some people had hailed that and attributed it to the Biden administration signaling to Saudi Arabia, look, like, look, more and more, you're kind of on your own. I mean, we're not, you know, and, and they say that's just a healthy thing, that too often client states take your backing as a reason to think they can act up locally and you'll always be there to help them. And one line was that, well, the Biden administration is signaling Saudi Arabia like uh, we may not be there the way we've always been there. And and, and, and that puts them in a mood to talk to Iran. Uh, what What's your well, I think it actually started with Trump when the U.S. did not react very quickly after the, the Iranians uh, uh, bombed uh, the Saudi oil installation back in the fall of 2019. Mm. Uh, you know, Trump was not eager to, uh, even though he gave them carte blanche in Yemen, he wasn't uh, eager to, to send U.S. troops and come to their, their rescue. But that's intensified under Biden, and and Yemen is a running sore, and it's got to end. Mm-hmm. And the only way that that the Houthis will stop sending rockets against Saudi Arabia is if the Saudis talk to the Iranians, I think, and mm-hmm. uh, try to advance some sort of uh, uh, durable ceasefire in in Yemen. Um, so you know, it was about time. Plus, the Iraqis have have tried to be mediators in this for a long time. When Qasem Soleimani was killed at Baghdad Airport or outside Baghdad Airport, supposedly he had come with a new proposal for the Saudis, for the Iraqis mm-hmm. to pass mm-hmm. to the Saudis. So this is this goes back, you know, um, at least until early 2020. Okay. Uh, I, I know you got to go, but but final question uh, uh, by way of recapitulation, I guess, or uh, partly. So your sense is that uh, the Biden team uh, would be happy to just more or less restore the deal uh, with the original terms, notwithstanding some domestic pressure to add new demands like about conventional ballistic missiles, uh, activities in the larger area in Syria or with Hezbollah, whatever. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, the, Sullivan and others have signaled that they that the, that they are interested in that range of issues, and that indeed, uh, sometimes they've made it sound like a prerequisite for even a, a status quo anti deal that there would be a commitment from Iran to talk about these other things. I think Iran is. Uh, said no thanks uh, if I'm uh, yeah, well no it's not a prerequisite um and as I pointed out you know the, these other discussions will be held with other parties at the table I mean uh, uh, Biden has already named uh, a, a Yemen envoy who's trying to end the war in Yemen mm-hmm. and he's doing that he's not talking to the Iranians directly yet but you know at some point perhaps he might he's already working with the UN he's working with the Saudis he's working with the Yemenis and, and others um we just sent uh, David Hale, uh, undersecretary, to Lebanon to talk about the problems that Lebanon is is facing. We just had a strategic dialogue with the Iraqis to talk about the issues with, with Iraq. Um, so, you know, I think that the Biden administration is committed to dealing with all these other issues, just not not saddling the JCPOA talks with them. Right now. Now, what they would like to do is lengthen and strengthen the JCPOA, 
Hmm. But I think the Iranians have made clear that first we get back into the original deal and we see how that works and whether the U.S. actually lives up to its commitments for more than two minutes. And then there can be discussions in which the U.S. will have to put more on the table, like Hmm. primary sanctions, for example, or access to the the U.S. uh, to the U.S. dollar, which is something the Iranians uh, could use. Uh, there, there will be other things that will have to be talked There's about a, to improve on the JCPOA. But these other issues, missiles, regional issues, will not be dealt with by the P5 plus one. And even if the deal is restored, there are U.S. sanctions and other forms of leverage that were never relieved in the first place as part of the JCPOA. And the administration might use those to try to get um, additional things out of Iran. Absolutely. That's the way to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Barbara. So your message to America is if you get a chance to bet even money that there will be a deal, liquidate <laughs> all your assets and put all of the money. No, 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 no. The IRA, no, no, no. Yeah. the house. Buy Bitcoin. Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. And also she has some gold she would like to sell you, but we'll, uh, we'll let her take care of that. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Barbara. This has been really uh, illuminating. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. Pleasure to see you again. Same here.